Hey, Mike, what do you do when uh, you have a player that doesn't uh, doesn't form to your expectations? Well, I have a stern conversation with them, and then I put them on my bench until I actually need them in my lineup. I kind of flirt Whoa, with them. Over. Hit the drop button and pick up somebody off waivers. <laughs> Let's talk about <laughs> waiver wire pickups for this week. Producer. Welcome to the Fantasy Forecast on Fantasy Football Advice Network. You are watching and we are talking. And this is the, the debut, or in Canada they would say the debut, of our waiver wire show. So we're going to be talking about the whole weekend, kind of recapping things, and uh, and giving you the scoop on who to like pay fab for, who to like pick up in your, in your leagues. Now, I'm focused on ESPN redraft leagues. Uh, Mike has a different focus altogether, uh, but hopefully we can be kind of comprehensive. And a lot of these names are going to be big pickups everywhere. Uh, keep in mind, we are recording this before the, the end of the first quarter of the Monday night football game. So we do have the Christian McCaffrey news. His Achilles bothered him to the point where he could not play on Monday night, uh, which means that Jordan Mason was, if you had him in your lineup or had an immediate waiver pickup that you could do and throw him in a lineup, that was fine. Uh, but depending on the the length of time that, that CMC is going to be out, it looks like Jordan Mason is the guy to own in that 49ers backfield. We'll see what his performance is like tonight. But we do have all the other 15 games that have gone down. So we have a good idea of what to look for. Keep in mind, it's week one. Typically, my strategy is not to go and make any major moves until week after week four, because that's when we have the best picture. But I know some of you are having to like put people on the IR and go grab somebody else. So these are the people that we're going to focus on. My little intro was kind of Tongue in cheek. Um, if you have somebody in week one that underperforms, uh, don't be too hasty in dropping them and picking somebody else up. However, if you do notice that uh, they were buried on the depth chart or failed to get the, uh, the the timeshare on the field that you thought that they would and somebody else who's on waivers did, then it, it could be a good idea in week one to go ahead and make that change. So uh, let's talk about those guys. Uh, Grindberg, let's start with the quarterbacks, uh, then move into the, like, slide into the tight ends. That sounds really bad. Uh, <laughs> do you have, have any quarterbacks that you're looking to maybe uh, put J Jordan Love on the IR and grab somebody else to replace him? Absolutely. And I'm going to tell you about a – top waiver wire pick and a guy that could probably even be starting in a lot of lineups you know as a spot start here and there when you need him and i'm talking about sam darnell he made an impressive debut with the vikings leading them to a convincing 28 to 6 victory over the new york giants i know it's the giants but he did complete 19 to 24 passes for 208 yards two touchdowns showcasing his accuracy and decision making he was i think he went 12 for 12 to start the game over 100 yards passing in that stretch and he was you know not really having to put a lot of adversity against him so in a game that he may have to face some adversity i think there's a lot more optimism that could be there his strong performance hints that darnold has the potential to be a reliable fantasy option moving forward he had a consistent performance he's brought Great supporting cast. Darnold benefits greatly from playing alongside elite talent like Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison. We're going to have to wait and see about his other ankle injury. But that dynamic duo provides Darnold with top-tier wide receiving options that could turn short passes into big plays. He's got the opportunity to grow knowing that his backup quarterback is done for the season. The guy that was on his heels, J.J. McCarthy. Uh, so I think there's a little bit less pressure for Darnold to have to perform right away. 
He's got great waiver wire appeal, so he's not a top draft pick in your fantasy league, but his week one performance gives him the opportunity ahead so he can make a prime candidate to be your waiver wire pickup. So I like Sam Darnold, a guy that you could probably plug and play when needed, especially in a dome where there's a lot of opportunity there for big performances with those receiving options. Uh, Biggs, what do you got in your range there? Do you have any quarterbacks that we should be looking at uh, in, in Yes. Sorry, Brees Bre- Hall scored a touchdown. Um, <clears throat> Brees Hall, my my top owned. I have more shares of Brees Hall than any other running back, and he just got a touchdown. And uh, in one, in my most important league, I need a thirty two point Brees Hall night to come back in that week. Um, yeah. So so uh, I do have some very important leagues, which Jordan Love is my starting quarterback, and so I need to pivot. Uh, he wasn't able to play. I had to do some things this week, but there were games that were already started. So it was people who were on the waiver wire that I had to go pick up. I did substitute, but I'm going to use that because I couldn't put him in my IR slot. Now I can put him in my IR slot and go grab somebody uh, without dropping anybody. So there are two guys that I'm targeting. And these are two guys that, uh, full disclosure, when the show sheet was revealed, it was to, to me to fill out and put in my net, my guys. Uh, it, it came before the games started last week. So two of these guys that I talked about absolutely hit this week. Um, on my In my ESPN leagues, they are the top two uh, scoring waiver available quarterbacks. And that is Jared Goff and Matthew Stafford. So I pegged them for waiver pickups, but before the weekend even happened. Uh, Goff uh, finished with 11.38 points. Uh, Matt Stafford, 14.68. And I'm sorry, I accidentally deleted the Derek Carr. Derek Carr led everybody on the waiver wire with 21 points. He absolutely should be owned in every league that you're in. If you heard our drumbeat through the the preseason, even our last, uh, what do you call it, the uh, bold prediction show, I said Derek Carr with Clint Kubiak and all the weapons that he has in New Orleans is going to have a huge year. He led all waiver wire quarterbacks with 21.43 points. He is available currently in 95% of leagues on ESPN. Okay. And that 21.43 points came on only 200 yards passing. They didn't need to throw the ball all over the yard. It was a game in which they completely blew out the Carolina Panthers by 37 points. And the game script didn't dictate Derek Carr go out and throw for 400 yards. But he showed that even against an elite passing defense like the Carolina Panthers, he is going to be able to do that. Now, Jared Goff had a little bit of trouble. He and Stafford each went up against pretty good defenses. They were in a little bit lesser of a scoring situation, but Derek Carr is the one to add. You got any tight ends for us? Well, I mean, you touched base a little bit on it, but I mean, obviously Isaiah Likely, who is coming into week two as the number one ranking tight end, is somebody that's going to be, you know, the number one probably target in all of the waiver wire situations right now, Biggs. I think that uh, his elite game shows that, you know, he's got a role regardless if Mark Andrews is playing or not. I think, you know, it showed that his versatility out of the backfield, they were using him in in, in design plays uh, and, and he was gained a lot of yards after the catch it showed his elusiveness and uh, i just really like what i saw you know they used zay flowers in a lot of similar plays but it looked like isaiah likely was just getting a lot more yards after the catch and uh, i really like his physique and the way he played so uh he'd be a top guy uh you're probably going to touch base on a couple of these other guys uh, cody parkinson you know with the puka nakua injury you know he's got a opportunity there signing that contract in the offseason i think he's got an opportunity to, to garner some targets Targets there, uh, you know, even if it's five to seven targets a game, that is very good, viable uh, tight end usage there. And uh, especially if you're streaming tight end, what do you got for tight end there, Biggs? All right. Well, <clears throat> again, uh, I've I've been watching Isaiah Likely since he was at Coastal Carolina. I've been a big fan of him, and just waiting for him to have another week like he did this week. He's done it before, but when Mark Andrews was hurt. Now he did it with Mark Andrews on the field. Now, the first thing to remember 
when we're talking about this is it's week one. Don't panic on Mark Andrews. He will be fine. The week one slate was littered with players who underperformed. And that's not a, a testament to what they're going to do over the course of the season. And Mark Andrews is no exception to that. He's going to be fine. He's going to likely, fin <laughs> likely finish mm -hmm. at the top <laughs> tight end. However, there were rumblings in the offseason that Isaiah likely was going to be on the field. Instead of being Mark Andrews' replacement, he was going to be on the field as another receiver along with Mark Andrews. So I was trying to tell people last week, pick up Isaiah likely as a tight end guy. That hit. Uh, there are a couple other guys. And again, not to like hammer too much on this Saints offense, but you saw Juwan Johnson catch mm -hmm. a touchdown and Foster Moreau catch Moreau. a touchdown. Derek Carr and Foster Moreau have been together for about five years. Moreau came out of LSU. Uh, he was a Raiders tight end but behind Darren Waller. Waller moved up, was hurt, and then moved mm -hmm. on. Moreau had an opportunity. The Josh McDaniels offense wasn't effective. Uh, he did see some some spots, but a lot of balls hit off his hands and turned into interceptions for Derek Carr, which was very unfortunate. But in this game against the Panthers, you saw Derek Carr utilize the both of them. Now, I am more inclined to, to lean towards the Juwan Johnson side and not the Foster Moreau side, although there is a world in which they can coexist as tight ends on your team. Again, the New Orleans Saints team is stocked with weapons. Jamal Williams is a pounder. Uh, he will show up in the show later on. Alvin Kamara is the do-it-all CMC clone in the Kubiak offense. Uh, Chris Olave is obviously the, the wide receiver one, but his numbers were a little bit suppressed this week. That'll change as the matchups change. Uh, Rashid Shahid is a deep threat. He's going to be great for you in best ball, and he's going to win some spike weeks uh, that'll carry you. Uh, then you have A.T. Perry, who's a target, but it looked like after those top two receivers and dumping off to Kamara, Foster Moreau and Juwan Johnson are Derek Carr's focus, so I would look for them. And then you brought up Colby, C-O-L-B-Y, like the cheese, Mike, um, Colby Parkinson. Uh, he's a guy who I talked about on the show all summer. He was a, a tight end in Seattle. He was given a free agent contract by the Rams. So the Rams have incentive to put him on the field and target him. Uh, we just had an injury to, to Puka Nakua, and he's going to be out for a little bit. So Matthew Stafford is going to need another target. And Colby Parkinson showed against the Detroit Lions that he's perfectly capable of stepping into that tight end role that Matt, Matthew Stafford hasn't had a top 10 tight end for a while. I think uh, Gerald Everett a few years ago was probably the last one, uh, unless I'm mistaken, and it was Tyler Higby. But Tyler Higby's hurt, at least for the first four weeks of the season. So get Colby Parkinson onto your team. Uh, he, he is going to give you touchdown upside and target upside uh, and, and could be one of those guys where if you listened to me all summer and faded tight end, um, here's, here's your first streaming opportunity for next week. Grab him, get those 10 points into your lineup and uh, and full speed ahead. Yeah, man. Now, I'm going to show you guys your one-stop shop to everything fantasy sports. We are here. We are here. FantasySportsAdvice.com offering the best fantasy sports social media platform. Why join endless Discord communities or the trolls of Reddit? <laughs> Fantasy Sports Advice is a community designed to help you win with 24-7 support. Go to FantasySportsAdvice.com and become a pro member for unlimited access. Again, go to FantasySportsAdvice.com today. Welcome back. And we're back. Uh, all right, let's uh, move on to some wide receivers. Um, Biggs introduces the WR waiver section. Oh, that's me. Uh, I have to introduce the, way, the wide receivers. Um, all right, so... Who are we looking at for wide receiver? This week, um, again, I'm going to be talking about this Saints offense. But first, I'm going to go to Indianapolis. If any of you were able to watch the game, there was a 60-yard bomb that Anthony Richardson threw down the field to Alec Pierce. Now, Alec Pierce was a deep threat at Cincinnati. 
He was one of the few, one of the the trio of wide receivers that made it look like Desmond Ritter could have an NFL career, but it wasn't Desmond Ritter. It was those receivers that were helping him out. And Alec Pierce was one of them. Alec Pierce has had an injury problem. And also he has been kind of stuck as the wide receiver three in an ineffectual Indianapolis Colts offense. Uh, which is now dealing with the loss of Josh Downs. So Michael Pittman got his wide receiver one targets, but the guy who was taking the top off the defense and benefiting from Anthony Richardson's absolute cannon of an arm was Alec Pierce. And Alec Pierce had a touchdown. He had a big deep pass. Uh, and these are the things that Alec Pierce is going to be doing throughout the rest of the season, uh, or at least for the time being with Downs on the men. But Downs is a, sh a short yardage uh, slot guy anyway. Alec Pierce is the outside receiver that is going to be running down the field and getting under uh, Anthony Richardson's ball. Deep throws. <clears throat> now, I saw this happening when Anthony Richardson was in first in camp in Indianapolis in 2023. There were some throws that he was making in their like little indoor facility or whatever, where he was throwing the ball like 80 yards. And you could watch in those videos how Alec Pierce tracked the ball and went to it. And he did the exact same thing in game one. I expected to see more of it last year, but Anthony Richardson only played in four and a half games. So that was a, a and, and Gardner Minshew can't make that throw. So that was something that didn't come to fruition, but Shane Steichen showed in game one with Indianapolis that that is something that is in the playbook and they're going to be utilizing every week. Alec Pierce running past the defense and Anthony Richardson just chucking the ball as far as he possibly can and Alec Pierce getting under it. Alec Pierce is available in 99% of leagues on ESPN. He should be available in yours. Go grab him. Now on to New Orleans, Rashid Shahid. He's available in 58% of leagues. Uh, he's another guy who's going, he's going to have a similar profile to Alec Pierce. There are two kinds of wide receivers that we're looking at. We're looking at guys who are going to get 12 targets and eight catches and 10 catches. Uh, those are your wide receiver ones with target volume. Then there are the guys who are going to be making two or three catches, but they're deep balls and they're going to be scoring touchdowns. Pierce is one of them. Rashid is another one. Khalil Shakir. There was a lot of question about what was going to happen with this Bills offense. Is it going to be Curtis Samuel? Is it going to be da Dalton Kincaid? What's Keon Coleman going to do? Uh, where's Khalil Shakir at? Well, Khalil Shakir has had a little bit of steam through the preseason. Uh, he's owned in 50% of the league, so that means that there's a chance he's not available in yours. But he did finish with 13.2 points uh, this last week on 9.3 points projection, and he was only targeted three times. So he did get that benefit of that touchdown, uh, but that was important. It And the Bill, he's part of the Bills offense. The last guy I'm going to touch on, and this is the most important. Hmm. Viewers will remember me saying all off season that it's really, really hard for wide rookie wide receivers and rookie quarterbacks to smash especially in week one and with rookie wide receivers who weren't drafted in the first round specifically, it's hard for them to sustain and have 800 yard seasons, 1000 yard seasons. But there's a guy that I've been talking about and you'll know this name because you watch me and that's Jalen McMillan in Tampa Bay. Now this guy was, he earned the, the wide receiver three spot on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He scored a touchdown in his first game as a rookie. Granted, it was on one target and one catch, but he did score that touchdown. It means that Baker Mayfield knows that he can go to Jalen McMillan, and Jalen McMillan is only going to grow within this offense. Mike Evans had a Mike Evans day. Chris Godwin did Chris Godwin things. Trey Palmer was on the field with me yelling at the TV going, what about Jalen? Jalen McMillan is absolutely in the plans. Grab him now because by the midway point of the season when – you would project a rookie would start going off. He's already going to be in full stride. Grab him now. He's owned in 90. He's available in 97% of leagues. You heard it here. He is a third round guy with first round talent, and that's going to bear out over the course of the season. Good call. Big Z. We've been on him as train all season long. And, uh, I'm glad that he got some exposure early and uh, they play a lot of three wide receiver sets there in Tampa. So he's going to see the field regardless and his talent's going to emerge. Now I got two guys that I'm going to talk about briefly here in 
ESPN leagues that, you know, they're owned in very, very few percentages of leagues. First guy I'm talking about is Wandell Robinson. He's only owned in 6% of ESPN League. So 94% of the leagues he's open in. And he's making waves as a key target as a waiver wire pickup this year for uh, this week for me. Despite the Giants' rough start to the season, and it was rough, Robinson demonstrated his potential and versatility as a slot receiver in week one matchup against the Vikings. 12 targets he received, a significant 28% target share, indicating he's a primary option in the Giants passing game. Although Malik Neighbors also had a great target share, Wandell Robinson is owned in very few percentage of leagues, and he's a key role in that offense. They have a vulnerable defense. You know, the Giants' currently offensive struggles highlight Robinson's potential upside. Minnesota's secondary, which allowed an average of 234 passing yards per game last season, proved to be vulnerable in the season opener. Robinson's role as a frequent target in the Giants' short game could make him an appealing option for fantasy managers looking to exploit their weakness. He's a guy that might be able to play in your lineup as a wide receiver three slash flex play with a very solid floor. And then, you know, he doesn't have a huge high ceiling. He won't break off, you know, a huge amount of touchdowns, but that PPR leagues, he's going to have some benefit there for fantasy managers looking to strengthen their wa roster. Wandell Robinson is in a prime candidate for your waiver wire this week. His significant target share role in the offense and potential increased opportunities makes him a valuable pickup. The the Giants are going to be playing from behind all year long, and I just think the targets are going to be there as a safe floor guy. And another guy I'm going to be talking about, too, in similar situation is, you know, Greg Dorch, slot receiver there. He had a commanding 8%, I mean, 8 targets last week, uh, you know, 25% target share. You can't scoff at that. I know that Marvin Harrison Jr. was on the field quite a bit, and his target share wasn't quite there, but I think that report's going to grow. But Greg Dorch, solid uh, pickup here, you guys, as a you know, slot receiver who can garner a decent amount of targets. Now, Biggs, let's move on to the running backs. And uh, you got any running backs that are uh, or viewers and listeners listeners should be targeting in their waiver wire this week i do and i but i want to start off with a couple of guys that i i want to warn people off of and the first one is las vegas raiders running back alexander madison the way that the game broke down for the raiders against the chargers on sunday <clears throat> benefited alexander madison in that he was put on the field uh in spots where zamir white hadn't been effective because of the situation that the Raiders were in. And then the Raiders didn't score any points because of the way that Gardner Minshew played quarterback and the, the fumble from Zamir White and the ineffectual, uh, the turnovers that Gardner, that Gardner Minshew had. Madison benefited from a very small portion. Uh, and once the Raiders were so far behind, neither running back played a factor. Zamir White is still the plan going forward in Las Vegas. So a one bad game is not going to kill what happens with that. Alexander Madison is not taking over this backfield. With that, and Zach Charbonnet is another one. He's He was the second leading scorer on the waiver wire. Um, it's still Kenneth Walker's show in, in uh, Seattle. They needed Kenneth Walker to do Kenneth Walker things, and Zach Charbonnet came on once the lead was comfortably in hand for the Seahawks over Denver, um, who never stood a chance anyway. All right. With that said, the running backs that I'm targeting on the waiver wire this week, uh, the first one is going to be uh, Justice Hill. He's owned or he's available in 96% of leagues. He is the passing down option for Derrick Henry. Now, Derrick Henry was effective at the goal line, but he looked like he was, uh, let's just say, 30 years old. Um, he might he might be 32. And he looks like 30, but he still looks like 30. He doesn't look like he has the explosiveness in his lower body the way that he has throughout his career. Still has the strength, but he doesn't have the explosiveness. He's not the third down back. That third down back is Justice Hill. He's going to be getting the lion's share of the targets. Um, in fact, if we look over what he did, um, he had three rushing yards and 52 receiving yards. So... 
he had, on six catches. So he's going to be the guy catching the ball. That's going to turn into some touchdowns. He's a good flex option. Uh, if not a, a running back too, if you're, if you're looking to replace an injury like CMC or something like that. The second guy is Jamal Williams. Again, the New Orleans offense. The reason that Jamal Williams becomes a thing is because he is the, the RB2 in that backfield. Alvin Kamara gets a lot of dump off passes, he, and he does get some handoffs, which does suppress Jamal Williams' uh, effectiveness and, and value in the first place. But Jamal Williams does get goal line looks. He is a short yardage guy, but he gets those goal line looks, and he's available in 93% of leagues. So that offense is going to score a lot of points. Derek Carr is going to be moving the ball down the field with Rashid Jaheed and um, Juwan Johnson and Foster Moreau, my other waiver wire pickups, and Jamal Williams is going to benefit that. Rem benefit from that. Remember, uh, he was a touchdown dependent running back option two years ago in Detroit when he led the NFL in touchdowns. So Clint Kubiak knows what he has in Jamal Williams. That offense is going to be highly productive. They're going to score a lot of touchdowns, a lot of points, and Jamal Williams is going to be one of the boats that rises from that rising tide. So grab him too. Yeah, I agree with those bigs. Now I'm going to get into two guys that are available in quite a few of ESPN leagues. And my first guy that is going to be a hot topic, especially after tonight, and especially if he has a good showing, he's doing not too bad right now. And that's Jordan Mason. Um, you know, McCaffrey continues to struggle with his calf Achilles injury. Fantasy managers should turn their attention to Jordan Mason, who is poised to become a major asset in the 49ers backfield. McCaffrey officially inactive for the monday night game tonight and this is going to be aired tomorrow on tuesday morning so we'll have a lot more information about that situation but elijah mitchell on the ir mason is now the clear rb1 in san francisco until christian mccaffrey returns this could be a long-term issue maybe mccaffrey we still don't know what's happening with that achilles so um jordan mason has been a standout performer during training camp which has solidified his position behind mccaffrey although he hasn't seen extensive action over the last two seasons his efficiency when on the field is noteworthy among 78 qualifying running backs since 2022 mason ranks second in yards after contact per attempt and 21st in missed tackles force per attempt according to pff these stats highlight mason's ability to create yardage and break tackles which could translate into significant fantasy production if mccaffrey's injury keeps him sidelined for extended period of time and you got to keep in mind that he is nursing an injury mccaffrey so he could be eased into the action right away which could op you know create more opportunities opportunity for Jordan Mason so he's a guy that uh, you know in a high flying San Francisco 49er offense could be a pivotal part uh, if he could stay healthy and that's a big if now I got one more guy that should be on your radar depending I don't think he's going to be a starter I don't think he's going to cut in too much to Travis Etienne's work but if Etienne were to go down Tank Bigsby has shown in this game that he can uh, you know bounce back after a really bad rookie season. He had a good, strong performance in week one. He emerged as, you know, a top waiver wire pick now in the running back landscape. Not much going on there outside of the guys that Biggs and I have talked about. Bigsby has shown promise. He rushed for 12 uh, times for 76 yards. His performance was highlighted by a 6.3 yards per carry average, demonstrating his potential to make an impact in the lineup. Given his impressive preseason and solid showing in the opener and, you know, Peterson's history of liking a shared backfield, maybe this could be a turning of tides. I know that, you know, Etienne's, uh, you know, history is great and he's he's been, you know, changed my mind over the years. So I love Travis Etienne, but they might be, you know, bringing in Bigsby to be more of a, a support back now and a really top handcuff and has shown the opportunity there uh, one year removed from a really bad rookie season giving a strong preseason and performance and promising regular season start tank bisbee can be an eight waiver wire ad that can maybe in deeper leagues sit on your bench and uh if an injury were to happen to etienne or you know him himself carving out a bigger role in the goal line uh you know he could be a guy that you could spot start in the future 
How dare you? <clears throat> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Take it's not shot. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to take a shot. I mean, there's not much out there right now. And a guy that rushed for 72 yards, it showed that, you know, maybe, you know, the Jacksonville Jaguars offensive line is is improving. Um, you know, they, they, it was a weird, weird game in general against the Miami Dolphins. So, like, I don't think it's uh, it's something that is predictive of maybe how the, the Jags actually want to run their offense. Um, you know, like I... It's absolutely something to watch. Yeah. Uh, the fact of the matter is that Tank Bigsby working as Jacksonville's RB2 had more carries than quite a few our people that we spent the offseason thinking we're going to be RB1s for the year. Yeah. So, um, that's definitely, he's definitely an option. Yeah, agreed. So we and 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 it granted an injury were to happen to to Travis Etienne, which you know, like this running back position, you can't predict injury, but you know they they are accessible to that. So you know somebody to have a handcuff, especially if you know the role there would be very prominent if uh, you know an injury were to happen. But the fact that he can come in, uh, you know, after you know a couple struggling plays from Etienne, I mean, it shows that there's some promise there. So. I'm not sold on him. I'd prefer to have a guy like Jordan Mason come in or a, J- a Jamal Williams, you know, who can steal touchdowns and have more of a reliable role, especially with Kendra Miller not there anymore. But uh, yeah, you know, there's not much there for the running back landscape, but there's some quite a few good targets out there in the quarterback, tight end, and uh, the the wide receiver room. So great show, Biggs. Great, great way to start off the waiver wires for 2024. And uh our next show will be none other than our start and sit show, which uh, we'll have to go over because I think we both hit some good ones last week on our starts and sits. And uh, yeah, man, let's keep the momentum going because our viewers are going to win championships with this advice. So cheers to that. Yeah, hopefully I do too. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully everybody in our circle wins championships and uh Yes. Yeah. Every every year, my home league, my home dynasty league, has a like a big party at at a shout out Tate. What's up, Tate? Uh, Tate and Sarah's house, and uh, all the owners get together. We do the draft. We have a Super Bowl party, but we have an opening day party for for Sunday at games, uh, and we hang out there all day. Yesterday was a taco bar. Drinks were flowing. We were drinking ciders and uh, high noon tea and whatever. Um, and uh, just just had a really good time um but yeah so uh <clears throat> we all got together and <clears throat> it was just it was like it was super fun and uh, uh i was given crap all day for the fact that i have like 50 managed leagues teams and <laughs> um everybody else was like i have five and the other, other guy was like i have a hard time keeping track of two and i'm like uh I have 50. Yeah. Um, not counting like all of my best ball that I was in. And I was just drafting all summer long. And uh, so far, my hit rate is about 50%. <laughs> across <laughs> the board. <laughs> that, that's life and that's football. Um, we're not in the business of what's going to happen. We're in the be- business of uh, what's most likely to happen. And so, you know, with that, uh, about half the people you, uh, talk about hit and about half the people you talk about miss because that's just the way that life goes um so yeah, yeah. well hopefully you won and uh yeah. so, uh, about 50 percent. so uh, <laughs> thank you guys for watching go ahead and like subscribe hit the bell yep. follow us on all the things at big boned ffb at schu1 tzy uh shout out schultz at ff connect 99 download the fsan app get involved over there um we are in your space, in your head, and uh, and we'll see you next time, and we hope you win. Hope you win, folks. Have a great week.